Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Amy Pfaffenbach, and I'm the Director of Meetings and Events here at AVLS. I would like to welcome everyone to the Limpa Press Satellite Symposium this morning. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. All of our attendees are muted so that we don't pick up any background noise during the program. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the AVLS website, and a link will be emailed to all who are registered for this event as well. You will notice on the control panel on the right hand side of your screen that you can type questions into the screen and it will be added to the queue. All Q&A questions will be answered at the end of the uh, webinar. And over to you, Eric. All right. Well, thank you very much, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, I'd like to start out with a thank you to the ABLS for providing this opportunity and this forum and also for you as attendees. I know many of you are dialing in from around the country. And I know this is an early time for those of you who are in the mid states and out west. So thank you for being here and taking the time out of your schedule to be with us. I'd also like to welcome our panelists. Um, today we have the Goal VA panel discussion. We're gonna start with Karen Ashford. Karen is a 20 year veteran of lymphedema therapy. She's a LANA certified lymphedema therapist with the Dignity Health System in Stockton, California. And Lindy McCutcheonson will follow her. She is with the Carolina Vein Center. She's the medical director for the Carolina Vein Center in North Carolina. So before we get started, I would just like to make a comment around the subject of lymphedema and really the nature of today's discussion. So historically, and what we've recognized over the last few years is that lymphedema patients tend to look for care in a number of different sources. And I think we've all recognized that it seems as though over the last five years or so, lymphedema patients have ended up in a lot of your practices. You know, historically lymphedema has been diagnosed at about 20%, meaning 20% of the patients with lymphedema in the US have received a diagnosis. And if you add the nearly 13 to 16 million lipedema patients to that mix, you have an incredible number of patients that are looking for options for care and for treatment around the country. The origin of diagnosis and treatment has changed over the years. But I think as we've seen organizations such as the AVLS and other organizations like that reach out for advocacy around lipid, lipidema and lymphedema treatment, more and more physician groups have recognized the need for proper early intervention diagnosis and treatment for this condition. So our goal today is to have a panel discussion. We'll start with Karen, move to Lindy, and then I'll summarize at the end with some points of access and, and hopefully simplifying the process of being able to provide patients with the equipment and the, and the care that they need. So with that, let me welcome our first speaker, Karen Ashworth. Karen? Thank you, Eric. All right, can everyone see my screen? We can. Great, okay. So I would say that 50% of my practice is with venous patients. And many of them have had procedures, but they continue to have swelling. And so you're intervening with the veins, but there continue to be lymphatic issues. And that's where it's important to offer your patients treatment, either a referral to a lymphedema cl clinic where they can receive manual lymphatic drainage, appropriate compression garments, learn exercises and about skin care. But also, I'm gonna talk a lot today about pneumatic compression because many of my patients are not able to continue this program successfully on their own. And pneumatic compression provides a powerful and very effective treatment that makes my patients successful in managing their lymphedema at home. Many patients have profound damage. So in addition to uh, venous disease, there could be uh, comorbidities of obesity. They could have had abdominal surgery or orthopedic surgery. There could be cancer comorbidities. And many of these patients will also have decreased range of motion, strength, dexterity, and pain, which makes it difficult for them to carry out a edema program. And many of my patients have difficulty actually even using compression garments. So pneumatic compression is my go-to for these patients. And I like that it provides both decongestion and compression. 
I'm going to talk in a minute about cellulitis and how many patients come to me with recurrent cellulitis and we're able to break the cycle using pneumatic compression. Many patients come to me with wounds and we also are able to break that cycle. Pneumatic compression is very easy for patients to use and my experience is that it has a very high compliance rate. That's also been proven out with evidence. Also in evidence is how pneumatic compression reduces healthcare costs. This is one of my patients with recurrent cellulitis and this patient had big challenges compressing his toes. So we found pneumatic compression to be a very, very good solution for him. I was very shocked when I first heard this statistic that patients with lymphedema are 71 times more likely to develop cellulitis than those without lymphedema. And again, in the evidence is how pneumatic compression decreases cellulitis incidence. Also in terms of wounds, there's plenty of evidence to show that pneumatic compression accelerates wound healing while it decreases swelling and it decreases wound circumference. Dr. Melissa Aldridge spoke yesterday and talked a lot about ICG. And one of the studies that she did that she mentioned was using lymphopress with the clear sleeves. And I was very honored to actually be a participant in that study. What we found was that using lymphopress, we could visualize that there was significant lymphatic vessel recruitment. There was also increased lymphatic uptake and propulsion in the lymphedema affected extremities, not only during the treatment, but after the treatment. It's very interesting because there have been a lot of ICG studies imaging the use of MLD and pneumatic compression, but this study that Lymphopress did with Dr. Aldridge is the only pneumatic compression study that has shown that Lymphopress can actually increase lymphatic function in the extremities that are affected by lymphedema. No other um, device has been able to prove that. This is just a uh, slide here showing the actual ICG with the clear sleeve and the lymphopress pump is um, active. And you can see it's amazing the, um, the activity in the lymphatic system that's happening. So, I think it's important to recognize that not all pumps are equal. I've been using pumps for the majority of my practice and I've used many, many different types. My experience is that most pumps have very limited programming and many of them have long cycle times which create a sustained inflation at the foot which can create pain, particularly with patients who have neuropathy. Many pumps have very limited pressure ranges, and so it can be difficult to treat patients who are obese or have heavy fibrosis if you have a pump that has very limited pressure that um, won't accommodate treatment for those patients. The majority of pumps only treat arms or legs, and there are no options to be able to treat the trunk or abdomen. So if you have a patient that has proximal needs, it's not appropriate to just use a single arm or leg sleeve. Many venous patients fall into the category where a leg sleeve will be fine, but some of them are complex enough that they need a pantsuit appliance. And many, many manufacturers have appliances that are very difficult to put on or difficult to clean or uncomfortable. And that's something that's really been solved by Lymphopress. Also, there are very, very few pumps that have overlapping chambers, which follow the principles of bandaging and create a gradient that prevents reflux of lymph and venous fluid. Again, many pumps have limited deflation and there can be actually even a tourniquet effect with pain 
and poor edema uptake because it's very important to create a negative space in order for the lymph to progress so that it can then be moved upward. Lymphopress is one of the very few pumps that can have the capability for pre-therapy, post-therapy, and can provide both sequential and peristaltic action. So you can see there's lots and lots and lots of options that are available for our patients. And it's good to be able to know what options are best and to be able to choose. Lymphopress also has Bluetooth programming, which makes it very, very easy to program devices and to change programming very easily, and also has a monitoring app that allows patients to be able to monitor their treatment and their condition. So in summary, Lymphopress effectively treats lymphedema as well as venous-related lymphedema, so flebal lymphedema, and the lymphopress systems have the very best range of features and appliances. This effective treatment can prevent debility and progression and improve patients' lives. My experience and evidence shows that it empowers patients to have the highest function and quality of life. And I'm gonna close with a patient who flunked CDT. She was unable to manage her um, swelling at home and once she was able to access pneumatic compression, she was faithful with that, used the compression, and suddenly her program became effortless and she was able to have better mobility, better function, and lower infection rate. I want to just comment that uh, a little bit after, um, in a little over an hour, I will be presenting a poster and discussing a patient who had venous ablation surgery. And it's an interesting case because she ended up having surgery on both legs. And she came to me about a year or so after the ablation on her first leg, and she had developed um, tremendous lymphedema symptoms. And we were not only able to help that first leg, but help the surgical results on the second leg. So do check that out. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to any questions. Great. Thank you, Karen. And while Lindy gets set up, uh, Dr. McCutcheon gets set up, um, you mentioned the treatment of patients who have that veno flebo lymphatic condition. Do you see that frequently in your practice? And have you found that there's any you know, specific maybe um, options that our audience can use when they're treating patients like that when it comes to edema treatment that's most effective? Yeah. Well, what I find is that I start with conservative treatment. Many of these patients don't know anything about exercise or elevation, and they've given up on compression. They find it difficult to wear elastic compression sleeves. So I will often use um, Velcro wraps with these patients. But many of them, even with that aggressive a program, uh, they still continue to have uncontrolled swelling. So I will often recommend pneumatic compression and depending upon the amount of fibrosis or the about, amount of body mass, I'll titrate the pressure so that they can effectively decongest the swelling in their legs. That's great. Thank you so much. So uh, Dr. Lindy McCutcheonson will be joining us next. Uh, we're, she's not going to be on video just because we want to make sure um, that- Okay, so hi, I'm Lindy McCutcheonson. Um, okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm Lenny McCutcheson and um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Okay, great. Great. So I'm Lenny McCutcheson and um, it's raining here in, in Durham, North Carolina. And and so um, we're having a little bit of a connectivity issue. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, and I'm just going to talk about managing swelling in a vein, typical vein clinic practice like, like we do here. Um, and the main thing is first is who comes to your vein clinic? Well, they usually come with common leg symptoms like a venous disease, tired, achy, heavy, tender, swollen legs that are all worse at the end of the day. The thing is they also usually come in with swelling. And swelling is the one thing that you have to really be careful about what you promise and what expectations you give the patient. 
because swelling can actually be caused by what I tell patients, 200 things between sitting and sunburn. So realistic expectations are actually really important when it comes to the patient's perception of what they call swelling. So with an initial visit, we usually see three types of patients in a typical vein clinic, patients with lymphedema, patients with typical chronic venous disease, and also patients with lipedema. And if you're not seeing very many patients with lipedema in your clinic, you probably just aren't diagnosing them correctly, or you just don't want to go there because I know it opens a whole can of worms. But it's important that you do recognize them and give them proper expectations because patients with lipedema actually do have the same symptoms as patients with venous disease, tired, achy, heavy, tender, frothy legs, swelling, all worse at the end of the day. And it's important for you to manage the lipedema patients a little bit differently than you would a normal vein patient. So what are realistic expectations? Well, in a vein patient, it's, it's reasonable to tell them that they may get some improvement because the actual swelling is from venous hypertension. At the end of the day, you're going to get swelling and congestion in the veins, that pressure in the vein exceeds the tissue. The body tries to equilibrate that and it pulls the fluid with it. So you get um, pitting edema in the extracellular um, space because of the, the venous hypertension and equilibration. When they go to bed at night, that um, differential changes. The vein empties when they elevate their leg in bed. The pressure is higher in the tissue than it is in the vein. The process reverses and it starts to try to equilibrate in the opposite direction, pulling the edema back into the vein. So what I tell patients is that if you wake up with swelling, that swelling is not from veins, it's from something else. But I think it is reasonable to tell the patients that about 50 to 70% have a perception of improved swelling um, with vein treatment. But I tell them it's, it's a fringe benefit. With lipedema, it's a different story because they don't have pitting edema. They actually have non-pitting edema. And as we know, edema is actually um, extracellular free fluid. And the current consideration is that the there is no increase in extracellular free fluid with lipedema. And therefore, it's not a classic edema condition at all. So what is it? Well, what the current consideration is, is that swelling is probably an extracellular gel matrix in that soft tissue. That matrix is, is that free fluid that's bound with glycosamine and glycans or GAGs, creating a proteoglycan matrix, which can be inflammatory. And we think that's why it's caused, causing non-pitting edema. And I think that's really important to know with lipedema patients because when you're talking about possibly doing a vein treatment and uh, whether you do or not, it's just up to your patient. What I tell them is that we're not going to talk about swelling at all because I tell them that there will be no change in their perceived swelling, their leg shape or their leg volume. Uh, what I do tell them if I do decide to treat them is that I'm going to probably decrease their leg symptoms by maybe 20 or 30 percent, that I'm going to you know, probably remove the component that's being caused by the venous disease, but they're still going to have tired and heavy legs because I'm not going to be able to remove the component from their lipedema. With the lymphedema patient, that edema is an extracellular uh, fluid and it's a water-based protein gel. So they do have usually pitting edema. But like Karen said, many of these patients have ambulatory issues. They're unable to comply compression garments and many have been prescribed diuretic by their primary care provider, which actually worsens that edema. So what, when I'm giving post-vein treatment swelling um, expectations, I tell the vein patients that about maybe 50 to 75% might have an improvement, but about 25% are going to have swelling is going to be unchanged or potentially increased. Uh, with, with the lipedema patients, I tell them that there will be no change in swelling leg shape or volume. And I tell the exact same thing to the lymphedema patients as well. So then after the vein treatments are done, I, the patients then come to me and they go, okay, so now what? I have swelling. What are you going to do next? So this is the way we approach once we remove the venous component, if we do vein treatment, our medical approach to them. 
we can either send them back to their PCP looking for, you know, complicated flow chart of how to manage their, um, or, or sort of figure out the cause of their edema. We can review their medications. And if it's something obvious like amylodipine uh, that's causing it, we can um, have their PCP recommend changes to their, um, to their medication. We can also, um, if you want to go through all the different causes from renal to cardiac, um, I don't actually do that in my clinic. I refer them for their PCP to do that. But I do think it's then important with the patient with swelling to go ahead and initiate the adjuvant modalities that we can do medically. And that is, of course, start initiating renal lymphatic drainage, uh, leg grafts, and new, uh, pneumatic compression. So with MLD, we explain that it... This is something that does require a prescription um, and needs to be done by a uh, certified manual lymphatic drainage therapist. We have a pre-printed MLD uh, referral uh, prescription that we actually do give the patients, but you can't just give them a, a prescription and send them on their merry way. So we actually have a referral source that we can then give patients uh, options in, in their area to go and seek someone who is a qualified certified, certified MLD therapist. Um, the one thing I do warn them about is the really good therapists move around a lot because they're recruited by other medical centers. But we also tell them that they, if they live, you know, outside of our area, to usually physical therapy um, centers can help them. They do understand that there's a limited coverage with insurance and that uh, it can be very time consuming to take the time to go get their MLD therapy. I do start it anyway, though, because the MLD, MLD therapists are incredibly important in this process. First of all, certified MLD therapists have spent hundreds of hours learning about the lymphatic certainly much more time than most physicians. So they're incredibly knowledgeable. They become our patient educators because they spend so much time with the patient and they actually become our, the patient advocates and help make dis, uh, recommendations for the patients. So then how do we approach these patients for the self-care, the non-medical step? Well, with the lymphedema and the lymphedema patient, it's important to teach them about decongestive therapies that they can do at home and teach them that this is actually a self-care condition because there's no effective, I mean, definitive treatments. There's just only effective therapies. So it's, we try to empower them to incorporate some decongestant therapies into their everyday life without becoming a prisoner to the condition. Surprisingly, many of them don't actually understand what decongestive is. They don't understand that we're fighting gravity and we've got to move this fluid, these proteins, uh, and some of these inflammatory elements out of their legs. So patient education is a big part of teaching them the self-care. We also call what we call the, uh, teach what we call the hold back the tide mentality, that once they fight gravity and are able to move the fluid out of their legs, they have to hold back the tide for 18 hours a day when they're in a standing or sitting position. And we think this is important for them to understand that if they sort of let down their guard, that edema is going to roll back down their, their leg, that this is a, a lifestyle change and that they have to adopt the hold back the tide mentality. Of course, compression is so important um, and graduated compression. Most of these patients don't really understand compression. They don't understand that it's over the counter and it's not a one size fits all. And so we really encourage them to and try and troubleshoot and figure out what works from them from compression shorts um, to uh, spanks to uh, anything that we can do to help get them compression and something that they will use. It's especially important with the lipedema patient to encourage them to do compression, what we call up and over. Because if you only push, put a lipedema patient in a knee high compression, that's going to cause their lipedema to worsen around their knees. If you put them in a thigh high, it's going to cause the lipedema to worsen around their hips. So we really push the lipedema patients to be in uh, compression all the way up and over so that their legs, legs, hips, and abdomen get compression as well. Of course, we encourage all these patients to elevate 
and we give them the visual that a drop of water on the ankle has to roll downhill to the thigh, that their legs don't have to necessarily be higher than their heart, but to elevate frequently during the day whenever they can. And then we talk briefly about lymphagogs. Lymphagogs is a term that I learned from Karen Herbst, and lymphagogs are any supplement or medication that actually move lymph. And the one that's most commonly used is diosamin. And diosamin is uh, found in many over-the-counter supplements. The one we like to recommend if they are going to buy one is Vein Balance by uh, MD Support, which they can buy on Amazon for $34 and it's 60 uh, pills in that. So if they can spread it out to once a day, they can reduce that to $17. Uh, diosamin is also found in a biopharmaceutical grade um, in vascularia. Now, Vascularia is an FDA regulated product, so it does need a prescription. And even though it's not um, covered by insurance, it is available at a reduced rate through Transition Pharmacy in Pennsylvania. Um, this is a little bit more expensive. And the, um, the trials on Vascularia to help get it covered by insurance are upcoming. So be watching for that. But I just want you to know that this is part of the, the weapons you can put in your arsenal. Uh, using these vasoactive medications. Deep breathing is something a lot of physicians probably don't know about, but if you, with exaggerated diaphragm movement, you can actually move lymph. And if you can realize that when you take a deep breath, you're pulling air in through a vacuum. And when you exhale, you can actually uh, create sort of a vacuum with a suction, pulling lymph and fluid out of the lower extremities as well. So so I encourage patients to, to learn about deep breathing and do it whenever they can, when they're in their car, when they're sitting at their desk, anytime they possibly can. Lymphatic yoga is another thing. Uh, Edley Wallace wrote this amazing book on lymphatic yoga, and there are many movements that patients can learn to do that actually facilitate lymph, lymphatic and fluid movement as well. Hydrotherapy is one of my favorite things I like to discuss. Um, and we encourage patients to find a pool, certainly with COVID they can't, uh, because if they can get in the pool at least once or uh, several times a week, it can do amazing results. With um, compression, you can get 20 to 30 millimeters of, of mercury at the ankle, 70% of that at the calf, and 40% and, uh, at the thigh. And this change in graduation is what actually drives the fluid out of the leg. Well, if you look at the hydrostatic pressure of water and the way you calculate that, it uses basically three principles. It uses gravity, which is of course fixed. It uses the specific gravity of water, which is one, which is fixed. And then it uses depth. And the farther you go, the higher the pressure. And at four feet of water, you can get a hydrostatic pressure of 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury at the ankle, which slowly graduates up. So what I encourage patients to do, I mean, you don't have to swim laps, you just have to stand there. And if you stand there, the hydrostatic pressure of water is doing the work for you. I encourage them if they walk, they can get resistance training, but I do tell them that they have to hold back the tide as soon as they get out of the pool and put their compression on. A super important aspect of managing um, swelling is teaching the patients about the musculovenous pump, the calf foot pump. I encourage heel toe walking, especially because you have to have good heel toe walking if you're going to move this fluid. When patients shuffle, they actually walk from their hip. And when they walk from their hip, it actually is just getting, causing them to have a tight tush and they're not using their heel toe at, at all. Sorry, my thing is, is forwarding. So what I encourage to teach them is that when the foot um, walks, the foot primes the calf. And then when you step forward, the calf actually propels um, um, the uh, blood in the veins and fluid in the um in the lymphatics forward so that actual good erect heel toe walking is very very important we uh promote that also with low impact exercise telling them that walking and cycling get that heel pump um going is very important but we encourage low impact exercises and not high impact because high impact exercises can actually cause 
inflammation in the tissue, especially for lipedema patients causing pain, or inflammation in the lymphatics and can impede the flow as well. So vibration plates and rebounders actually do help with um, edema in the, and swelling in the lower legs. Uh, rebound therapy actually sort of is a um, is sort of an exaggerated uh, calf foot pump, and as long as the patients can balance on these uh, rebound trampolines, uh, it's something that we encourage them to do. And if you've never been on a vibration plate, especially a standing one, I encourage you to do so because sometimes you uh, the, it's hard to keep your balance. So what the vibration therapy does, we suspect, is cause like isometric. Um, muscle contractions and these micro muscle contractions actually propel the uh, the lymphatics, the veins, and the fluid out of the leg as well. We tell them to try and incorporate things that uh, can activate the calf foot pump while they're sitting because a lot of these patients have mobility issues. And so there are lots of tools out there. There's sitting um, cycles, sitting pumps, and re small rebound. Um, trampolines that they can do while sitting, sitting at their desk, sitting, watching TV. There are other decongestive tools out there that we tell them to seek and learn to use with dry brushing, deep tissue muscle rollers, and soft tissue muscle rollers. All of these work um, from distal to proximal. The patients can do them at home while they're watching TV in some of their idle time, and they um, can actually use them along the lymphatic channels to actually move fluid out of their uh, legs as well. There are some other decongestive tools you may hear about called, one of them is a gua sha tool. These have to be done by specially trained technicians. It does cause bruising, but they do work. There are no uh, gua sha tool specialists in North Carolina though, but I just want you to know about those. So then, and what can we do to help the patient that is both a medical and self-care? And that's where I, recommend pneumatic compression because it's a it's a medical uh, recommendation that the patient can do at home it's usually covered by their insurance company and it is very easily incorporated into their daily lifestyle um, like was previously discussed they can have sleeves they can have pants there's arm sleeves there's abdominal um, attachments as well but I I am a, a huge advocate of using the pneumatic compression because it's something that they can do at home. They can do it at home every day and they can incorporate it into their normal lives. Like, like um, Karen, I am a huge fan of Lymphopress, mainly for two reasons. One, it has the zipper instead of other Velcro straps. The zipper makes it easy for the patient to use. It also has these boot straps. And what that does is that if you, if the patient can pre-zip these, they can put it on. They don't need anyone else to help them with it. They don't have to lean over if they have back issues. And just by putting their foot into the sleeve, they can easily just pull it forward and pull their own sleeve on and not need anyone else to help them get started on this process like some of the other pumps can do. If it's easy to use, I know they will use it because one of the problems with compression devices, if they're hard to use, is they stay in the box. And I tell them it doesn't work in the box, it doesn't work in the drawer, and it doesn't work in the closet. So it really it's important to find a pump that's easy to use, and certainly I think the Lymphopress is. Uh, we went up, the, the advantages of, of the pump have, were previously discussed. Um, and so I will actually talk about how it helps the lipedema patient. So I already told you that there is no real free fluid in the extracellular space. There is no real true edema with the lipedema patients. Um, and using a pump, we know, doesn't really change the volume. But the main thing it does, it does improve the discomfort and it does improve the pressure. So we're actually looking at um, what it does do in lipedema now with upcoming studies. But the speculation is that it actually mobilizes some of these inflammatory elements in the subcutaneous tissue and may actually break up this proteoglycan gel matrix that we talked about. So uh, in the lipedema patient, it does improve pain and discomfort, uh, which then improves mobility and improves their uh, activities of daily living as well. So uh, most of you probably realize that ordering a pump is not as easy as it seems. 
And from a doctor's perspective, we do want to help the patient patients, but if ordering a pump is a huge pain, we're not going to. It can be very time consuming. There can be lots of paperwork uh, with uh, letters of necessity. Uh, there can be patient um, troubleshooting that goes along with it. There's no reimbursement for our time. And if the employees of the clinic get involved, they're actually being paid by the healthcare system. They're not being reimbursed, uh, reimbursed either. And if you're not careful, ordering a pump can actually cost a physician or healthcare uh, system money. So there has been a disincentive for doctors to order pumps. And I have definitely experienced that in the past. I have been annoyed. I have been frustrated. I have been irritated. And I've almost given up ordering pumps in the past because it was just too time consuming. And then fortunately, I found John. John is my lymphopress rep in the, um, um, Central North Carolina. And he actually told me that we could create a system that would take the pressure off of me, the pressure onto him and help order these pumps. And this is one I wanna pass on to any providers out there. John actually comes to the clinic and he does the paper pushing for me. The patients actually call John with most of their questions and concerns and troubleshooting. And once the, the, the uh, paperwork is completed and the insurance company um, has um, gotten the approval, which John and his team does, the reps actually measure for the, the pump, they process the orders, they go to the patient's house and deliver it, and they are the ones that educate the patients on the lymphopress. And if there's any questions, they of course consult with me, but it's an educated team and helps increase the success of this practice. So in the very first visit, we write for, um, we document the compression in the chart. We, almost every vein clinic does this anyway, is document compression. And we do leg measurements as part of our standard treatment anyway. Then if I actually suspect that a patient might become a pump candidate, certainly one of the lipedema patients or the lymphedema patients, then I have created this chart where I do a quick staging of those um, lipedema, lymphedema or both patients just to sort of get the process started and have that documentation. It also gives another area in the chart where I've documented conservative therapy. Then I send the patients away with this form that I created. It's called the pneumatic compression pump, what to expect form. This tells the patient that they have to have documented compression for four weeks before we can start even the ordering process for the pump. Then it says that after four weeks, we need to get together again and have a conversation to see if their conservative therapy is working. This this is usually done by the nurse in my clinic, um, which takes some pressure, uh, more pressure off of me. After that, we explain that the paperwork process gets started, and that's where the lymphopress rep then starts processing the paperwork, and the lymphopress rep actually deals with the insurance company. The, mo the beauty of this form is it has the name of our rep and phone number on there, so that if the patients have questions about where they are in the process, they call John instead of us. So four weeks later, we have this little form. It's just a check form that the nurse usually fills out, or if I happen to be seeing the patient, then I fill out. And then that's when John gets involved and starts processing the paper. The beauty is with the relationship I've created with my lymphopress rep, this process takes me only five minutes, which is wonderful to be able to provide a pump for my patients for only five minutes of my time. The, the, Lymphopress rep is doing most of the work. He's pushing most of the paperwork. He's talking to the insurance company. They're dealing with the patient uh, troubleshooting phone calls. And he actually makes sure that the patient gets a pump, a pump that fits them and teaches them how to use it. So there's very little work for me and my staff. The patients are incredibly happy. So this creates a win, 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 win scenario for me, which makes me as happy as can be because I get to help my patients and um, it's a little hassle for me. So with the lipedema and lymphedema patients, there is no question that they are challenging patients, but I can tell you it's worth it. Because this is one of my favorite quotes of all times. 
of all the pleasures life can gain, tis not in treasure, but relief from pain. And if you can actually improve the pain and pressure and the quality of life of these patients, you're giving them something more than winning the lottery can do. Thank you. Lindy, thank you so much. That was uh, tremendous. Karen, thank you as well. We have a couple of questions that we're going to ask or that we're going to answer here, and I'll, I'll pose them to everybody. I would encourage everybody to go ahead and pose your questions in the channel, and that'll be shared with us so that we can so that we can answer those for you. Give me one second here. Lindy covered uh, what I wanted to share with you, but we do have a document, and I'm not sure why I can't share my screen here. Probably. Amy, can you, uh, is that something that you need to send to me or give me the ability to do? All right. Regardless. Um, Eric, I just sent it over to you. Okay. All right. I'm not sure if you guys can, can you still hear me and see me? Okay. All right. Um, I'll go ahead. I'll skip on that right now. Let's go ahead and move into our Q&A session. One of the things that Lindy did mention, uh, Dr. McCutcheon mentioned and Karen mentioned, is the importance of documentation really from the beginning to the end so that a patient, we know that a patient qualifies when we go to get insurance access and coverage. Um, we do have a kind of a standardized form. It's a lymphedema assessment form that we can provide to anybody who's interested. And what we, we typically recognize this as a bookend note. So it's a standard note that you can use. It's similar to what Dr. McCutcheonson created for her own clinic, but it's a more generalized form that you can use to document care on day one and then 28 days later, use the same form to document completion of care and whether or not the patient would need a device at that point. So we can easily share that and happily share that with everybody if you're interested. Um, let's go ahead and look at a couple of the questions that have come up. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with the first one here. This is a question for Karen. First off, a bunch of comments on both presentations, just thanking you for the, for the points and for the discussion. So both for Karen and Dr. McCutcheonson. But Karen, there was a question here that says, thank you. What are the parameters for pressure that you use for a leg or for an arm? You're muted. I still can't hear you. There we go. Okay, thank you. So in terms of parameters for pressures, I do a lot of different things to determine that. Having said that, I always start low and titrate upward because I want to determine a patient comfort level. One thing I want to mention is that most cardiac conditions are not contraindicated for pneumatic compression use, just uncontrolled congestive heart failure. However, if I have a patient with a known cardiac morbidity, I will um, start at maybe around 30 millimeters of mercury. I will monitor for shortness of breath. I will have a conversation with them while we're doing our treatment and our trial in the clinic. And afterwards, I'll um, watch them, I'll observe them. And most patients I've found are usually somewhere in the 40 to 45 millimeters of mercury range for both arms and legs, but it depends on factors of fibrosis and body mass. So if I have a patient who has quite a large body mass, I may go upwards towards 50 or even 60 millimeters of mercury. In rare cases, I go above that, but you find that with these larger patients, either because of obesity or fibrosis, that to get an effective treatment, they need more pressure. So that's kind of how I work it. Um, Lymphopress does have a document that I created. I collaborated with uh, Drs. Mouse and Shingale and presented at the uh, 2015 International Lymphology Congress. And that has some guidelines for specific diagnostic categories. Great question, thank you. Great. Thank you. 
Um, Dr. McCutcheon, a couple of questions for you. One is there's a request if you could, uh, the book, the yoga book that you mentioned, uh, we have a, an attendee looking for the name of that book. A couple of questions about how people can get together with you. And then we- Hey guys, I'm sorry able, I'm having some- uh... we, can, we can hear you now. Okay, so the book is by Edley Wallace and it's called uh, Lymphatic Yoga. Edley is a um, um, certified MLD specialist and I think she's in Florida. She's an amazing woman. So it's called Lymphatic Yoga by Edley Wallace um, and you can probably find that online. Um, what were some of the other questions? Um, there was a question about just how to connect with you, which um, we can find out who that was and share that information with you if you want to reach out to them. Um, there's a question here about how do we get John okay. in our clinic? So let me, uh, I'll answer that one. Uh, so John is uh, an incredible representative for Lymphopress and he's done a, done a really great job over the years he's been with us. We really make it an effort across the country to have very highly trained and, and you know, expert uh, technicians who work with us. So I think what ideally what we hope would be that you would all have that experience with Limpopress when you, you know, when you're looking to work with us. So if you are looking to find a John, uh, what we can do is try to replicate him and have him come out to your clinic. But reach out, let us know, and we'll do what we can to make that connection for you. Um, there's a question here, and Lindy, let me throw this to you, and Karen, you may have some thought here as well. The question is, how do you protect the abdomen or pelvis of a lymphedema, or of a lymphedema patient when using a leg sleeve as a part of the pump? I'll go ahead and jump in, um, since Lydia's having a problem with audio. Um, well, oh, go ahead. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, Libby, why don't you go ahead since the question was posed for you and then Karen can So what, up. what I tell the patients is that sometimes the pants, uh, we, 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 okay, so we actually recommend if a patient has um, significant lipedema tissue in her uh, abdomen, pelvis, buttocks area, we recommend using the pant. Because uh, you've got to push that that fluid up and over. If it's a leg sleeve only, we say, look, we understand the leg sleeve is easier. We'd rather you move something than nothing. So we encourage them that they have to use some sort of a compression garment um, to keep moving it up and over. So they have to do sort of a combo um, a, a combo garment, like with the leg sleeve and a compression garment above that. That's great. Um, I'll mention from a manufacturing perspective, and then Karen will get your uh, your clinical opinion here too. From a manufacturing perspective, one of the things that Limpopress has done over the last really almost 10 years, but certainly in the last five, has looked to take a lot of the technology and push it through our entire line of products. So we do have access to some of the pants type garments in what has been coined out there as a, a simple or advanced or entry level device. So you do have access with Lymphopress to some products that you may not have access with other manufacturers. So that's something to look into if you're running into that problem on a regular occasion. Karen? So I'd like to just add that if I have a patient who, let's say for mobility reasons, has difficulty getting into a pantsuit garment and can only use leg sleeves, um, with these lipedema patients, they still need to have stimulation at the inguinal nodes and the deep abdominals. And usually these patients can reach that area, whereas they may not be able to reach their feet. So I will make sure that they have a good um, MLD program that they're doing at the same time as they're using their pump. I'd like to just mention that as a lymphedema therapist, I have a difficult time getting any patient to do manual lymph drainage except when they're in their pump because it's almost like it's a container for lymphedema treatment time and so it's easy to get patients to stimulate their uh, proximal lymph nodes during pneumatic compression treatment. Another That's thing true. I'd like to mention is that with Lymphopress you have 
a huge amount of adjustability in terms of the pressures. And so if there's a need for less pressure over the abdomen area, it's possible to drop the pressure there. So that's another way to protect the abdominal region in a lipidemia patient. That's great, thank you very much. Um, Karen, I'm gonna ask this question of you and then Linda, you may have an opinion here as well that um, if you do, please feel free to share. Okay, the question is, is there any advantage in using flat knit stockings for lipidema or lymphedema? In my practice, I do quite a bit of custom flat knit and it provides a better containment. They're thicker than the circular knit, they're easier on the skin, but they're also hotter and um, they're more expensive. So I would say that with my patients of size who uh, have lobules, circular knit is not a good option. The, the over-the-counter stockings are gonna cut and bind into their skin. So yes, there's absolutely an advantage of going with the, the custom flat knit with um, patients that have large limbs um, that need more containment. Great, thank you. Lindy, any, any suggestions there on that or is that covered? No, that is covered, except what I would encourage providers to do is that clearly explaining all of this to patients is time consuming, uh, generates a lot of questions, and it is shows the importance of having a relationship with a certified MLD specialist who can do the patient education and patient advocacy, help talk them through these types of compression garments, which one is best for them. And so if you create a relationship with um, some local um, certified MLD therapist, it actually makes it better for the physician or the provider as a better patient outcome and it's a win-win. Fantastic, thank you. And I think we have time for one last question here. and. Um, I'm not sure who will take it. I'll start, and then if anybody has thoughts, they feel free to chime in. The question is, cost and insurance coverage has been a long-time problem as well as coding. Any help coming in, um, coming in over, the, or overcoming these obstacles, I think is what the question was meant to say. So um, I guess it really depends on what we're talking about when you say insurance coverage. So pneumatic compression is certainly covered through Medicare, most Medicaids, and most private insurances. They all have different policies and procedures, but if you're working with a lymphopress representative, we try to take as much of that off of your plate as, as we can. So that will determine the approval process, authorization process, and access of the, of the equipment for the patient. Um, if you're talking about care for the patient when it comes to treatment, I think Lindy mentioned that in a number of different ways that this is a complicated condition, and it's something that we have a lot of advocacy around from a number of organizations, including the AVLS, to try to provide better care for lymphedema and lipidema patients. Right now, there are shortcomings in our healthcare system when it comes to that, and I think we all recognize that they're trying to move things in that direction. Any comments, uh, Lindy or Karen, on that subject? I know it's a, it's a complicated topic. So what I find is like, like Dr. McCutchinson, I will identify patients from the time I assess them that are candidates for pneumatic compression. And I'll educate them from the beginning about all the different treatment alternatives for lymphedema. Because conservative treatment is a requirement for most insurances in order to attain pneumatic compression, I talk with them about um, static compression options, and many of my Medicare patients don't like the idea that they have to currently pay out of pocket for these static compression garments. But I'll explain to them that our goal is to get pneumatic compression for them, and that that is usually paid for in full by most Medicare plans, and many other insurances cover the great majority of costs of pneumatic compression. So that motivates my patients to actually go ahead and do the static compression program. And many of them find that that's very, very helpful. But again, it's not effective for everybody, and a lot of people have uncontrolled swelling. So we, as Eric said, we do not have a perfect insurance system. We 
need to have better coverage for compression garments, but many patients will swallow that bitter pill and go for it, knowing that they can get pneumatic compression covered down the road um, if their compression garments fail. Fantastic. All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, I think with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I thank the panelists. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Dr. McCutcheonson, for being here today and, and for presenting. Um, we appreciate everybody's uh, participation here today. Anybody who did register will receive a, a gift card. We weren't able to provide breakfast for you today, so hopefully you'll take that gift card and go buy yourself a cup of coffee or breakfast. I'd love for you to post some pictures of your gift card with a cup of coffee and just say uh, tag the AVLS in that, um, and that'll be out shortly. But thank you all for attending today. We'll certainly send everybody who registered some information, including the assessment form, lymphedema assessment form that was discussed during today's presentation. And if anybody is looking for a local LymphoPress rep, we will try to duplicate John and get somebody out to you. Thank you all so much. Have a fantastic day and a wonderful ABLS.